Okay, we are back to recording the interview with Thomas Van in his library. All right, so you just finished talking about the former dean, and there were some other <coughs> names that you were that you looked at. You're looking at the bulletin right now of the different faculty members. Well, I think Professor Starr was really a man, an outstanding man. <clears throat> His father was a circuit judge in western Kentucky. And they did not have enough political clout to move him to be president. I don't know what it was, where it was, who it was. But I think he would have been a good president, and I don't know who they picked in his place. Mm -hmm. But it's interesting to me that uh, one of the presidents of the University of Kentucky taught me social science in junior high school, Frank Dickey. Mm -hmm. And that Adolph Rupp or somebody was very disparaging of President Dickey as to his qualifications to be president of the university. <clears throat> that was, you know, had Barry Bryant down there coaching football and Rupp coaching basketball, and you can't have two kings. And that couldn't last too long, and it so Ralph, so of course Bryant went back to. Alabama, where he distinguished himself more. He was already distinguished. But there wasn't any way for me to even think about playing football at the level that Barry Bryant required when I got back from service. I was too small to start off with, too slow, too weak, <laughs> too, too anything. <laughs> they really went on a professional thing. <clears throat> but I say Starr had some effect on me. I admired him. I told you about McEwen. Bill Matthews taught, taught real estate law to me. And he described the fee simple title as a bundle of sticks and if you, one of them was called a lease, and you could take that stick out and still have the fee simple title, and it did a certain thing. Then you had an easement. You take that stick out, and it, you could describe it, but it still, the fee simple still remained whole, but the, the features of the easement are a condition or a covenant ran over it. And you had these things that ran with the land. It ran, some things were, that ran with the fee simple and some didn't. And his explanation of that enabled me to have a very basic understanding of what I think a fee simple is and, I, and I'm able to still express it based on what he taught me at the University of Kentucky. I remember it well for some reason. And he went to the University of Michigan and was, uh, I guess he was a scholar, but he didn't act like one, kind of. I guess he really was. He, he became dean. <clears throat> seemed to me like he died early. I don't know what was the cause of that. But he... Yeah, th yeah. <clears throat> Professor Matthews became dean for, for a yeah. while. Yeah. For a while he was served as dean. I don't know not, when not he passed while, away. Not while I was there. But. Yeah, it was after you passed away. After after. He, after um, after you graduated, he became dean maybe in the late late fifties because at least in nineteen fifty eight he was dean. I know that. I 
Well, I don't know when star. Does this, does this thing say when they held? Here, let me see. Uh, it says Dean since September of 1948. It doesn't say when he quit. What's that? Well, it didn't say in there. Well, he was still Dean, I guess. Yeah. So he was a professor. What, what date is this? Oh, this is when I was there. Yeah. yeah. So okay. he was a professor starting in 1947. Star was. Starting in 1947. And then in March of 1948, he became... Uh, so in 1948 he became a full professor, and then he then became the dean in September of 1948. So he was there a year before I got there. Yeah. <clears throat> well, Professor Ham, I remember him. He taught corporations, and he was a, a nice guy, but he he never did have a close uh, I, I couldn't see he he was a, he was a nice guy and he was a pretty good teacher but I don't think he ever connected much with the student body mm -hmm. but that was just me he probably connected well with a lot of people he um, ended up I think being at the law school until about 84 somewhere along that but yeah. you know he's a, he's a Harvard guy, <clears throat> and they got an air about him. You know, I'm not I'm not criticizing it. I'm just describing it. <clears throat> Whiteside taught the states and stuff like that. He did a lot of work with the elderly. When he retired, I had a lot of contacts with him. I think he wrote a book on elder law or something. <clears throat> Maybe revised it two or three times. <clears throat> but he was a he was a is, was a good man, and his wife was right with him on a whole bunch of stuff that they were doing, and he. But he had a hard time. If the hogs was eating him, he'd have a hard time saying suey. <laughs> it's one way I would describe it. And he and I were good friends, and I'm not criticizing him. His cadence or his ability to to make a point, it just kind of went. He was hard to follow in the lecture. But he was one of the best-hearted professors I ever had, I think. What type of professor? Best-hearted. He was a good-hearted guy. Harding? Hearted. Oh, hearted. Yeah. Hearted. He was like a good a he, Yeah, he was the best-hearted guy, teacher that I know if I ever had. As far as being kind, he was a kind man in my book. <clears throat> Very finely educated. If you flip to the next page, you'll see some more. But is, all right, is he the only one? Did all that him? My gosh, I didn't know he. I knew he was pretty well educated, but damn. <clears throat> He he brought a he brought a lot with him, <clears throat> and then Roy Morland. Well, Roy Morland is Roy Morland. He was a he was a different breed of cat. He wanted to talk to you about sitting down on a river bank, a Kentucky river, on a rock, and and pondering this negligent homicide, thinking about it, thinking about it, thinking about it. Then I got down here in Bullock County. I think I sent him the first time I had a brief in the Court of Appeals. It was not a very good 
but not a very well written document. But I was I didn't know it wasn't written until I got more information. I sent him a copy of it, and he never did say anything about it. I, and I was so proud to have a case in the Court of Appeals, and I so I sent it to him, and I never did hear anything about it. But uh, was that a criminal case? I think it was. I don't know what it was, but I sent him. I think I had a, I had a traffic ticket case. You know, you're asking about what a general practitioner does. There was a kid down there named Huff, and he later drove a lot of race cars. This is, he was just out of high school or something, and he had a was in love with the girl at Lebanon Junction. So he was all the time driving from Shepherdville to Lebanon Junction at a high rate of speed. <clears throat> and these police catch him, give him tickets and stuff, and he got so many he he tried to get away. So he was going over there to see her and a state policeman got after him and he speeded to Lemon Junction and, and got on uh, a road headed, I think it turned out to be a gravel road in those days, and he's headed towards Nelson County with this policeman in hot pursuit. Well, this kid's a good driver, so he takes a sharp turn on this gravel road, and the policeman behind him fails, see, and wreck, runs off that road and wrecks that car. <clears throat> so he calls ahead, and they get a state police coming from Bardstown. And so the kid gets across the Nelson County line, and this policeman intercepts him some way, and brings him to bay and gives him a ticket. Or maybe he first he brings him back to where this other guy is. And so this guy that was chasing him gives him a ticket to the Bullitt County Court. That's before we had lawyer judges, to the Bullitt County Court. And then the other guy sit, sit, sitting there and he he just copies everything off of this ticket for speeding and all that and put, puts it in Nelson County. So the kid comes in there and so I look at that and I say, well, what I got to do is, is get this case settled in Bullock County before they can get a hold of him and that'll end it. So. I went over and got a hold of the county judge and Huff and we minimum fine or something and pay it. So then I go over to Nelson County and plead double jeopardy. Big deals, double jeopardy. And John Talbert is the county attorney and this guy that's the county judge is not a lawyer, but he's big time UK guy. Nice guy, Sutherland. They run those fire mills over. And they were wealthy people, and but he was county judge, and and he enjoyed that authority. So the county attorney advised that it was a legal thing, and that he could they could had jurisdiction, and they could fine him. So they fined him minimum fine. So I appealed it to the to the Nelson Circuit Court. Judge Gentry, bless his heart. So he has a force county circuit, and he's been fooling me in, Jer in Bullock County, and uh, we had political differences. Then that I be he he was always on the other side for no for no reason with me, except he knew the other people. You know, I come down there in Bullock County without a kids and cousin or a high school friend, and I wasn't part of the club. So he looks at this, and he's gonna break me from sucking eggs, teach me to, so he finds him $100 maximum. Well, I appealed that to the, to the Court of Appeals on the grounds of double jeopardy. 
and the case went to the Court of Appeals, and they decided in my favor, but they ruled that it was cruel and inhuman punishment. And I, in my briefs, I said it was only double jeopardy. I shut the door behind me. But they didn't even pay attention to that. They, but they picked out a constitutional violation. So as a bird dog, I smelt a damn bird that was violating the Constitution, but I, my hammer was not hitting on the nail head, according to the Court of Appeals. And then I went back and looked at that double jeopardy sum, and it, it, my case didn't quite fit that. I don't know why it didn't, because when I look at it now, it looks to me like it would have to be double jeopardy. So that might have been what I sent more than I was proud as a peacock. I, you know, I... So what, are there, is there any other? Yeah, let me see on here. Roy Moreland, Frank Murray. Now, Frank Murray was uh, the lawyer for the university. He taught me contracts and ethics. The only A I made in law school was with Frank Murray. And there were three of us that got an A. A guy named Bland, who was the best student in the class. He later became a big firm lawyer in Alabama, and he got retired, and he went back to uh, Adair County and went living on a farm, and not a recluse in that country, but a recluse from the law. He never attended any function or anything. I never hear of him or see of him on any—I don't know if he's still living even. But he was a really a smart guy, but he was not a friendly guy. And the other one was a good guy. He later, he practiced law in Western Kentucky and became a United States District Attorney for the Western District of Kentucky. And had made a name as a scholar kind of for himself. And he had a good had a good life and did well. I don't remember Nelson. Paul Oberst taught me constitutional law. Oberst was an extreme liberal. He and his wife. They were active with uh, th this group in Louisville that were turned out were not communists, or they might have been communists. But they weren't trying to overthrow violently the law in America. And they tried to do something in the mountains, and they persecuted the hell out of them. Tried them in federal court and did everything. And Oberst was, tendencies went that way. He was always for this extreme liberal side of the Democrat Party. And I'm for the was forth some of that, but not near as... Not how, was, how was he in class as far as... Did, he, did was, he have a good... Was he a good lecturer? Or? I think that he his style appealed to a lot of people. It didn't appeal too much to me, but it, he... His mannerisms and all, it didn't... It, it was... I don't know if it, it wasn't too refined exactly, but it was it was different. It was not a homely type of trying to lecture somebody down at the grassroots and bring it out. When, when Murray was lecturing, they laughed at me. He was telling some story about Lexington and how it was going and and all. And this dump that I told you about that was over there, and and he mentioned that, and and I I he, I was so engrossed in what he was saying, I said I remember that, and all these guys that weren't from Lexington, everything looked, they looked around and they laughed me out of the damn classroom almost, you know. I said, I'm right there. I said, well, I remember that. <laughs> I, I just it was spontaneous, yeah. you know, and. Uh, and he he had a shake and he 
take his finger and do like that. And that, that other judge besides uh, Stevens, and I'm not calling his name, he he used to imitate Murray. Every time we'd go anywhere around the group, why they'd call on him, and he was really good at imitating Murray's calls. Well, he, he I was having a little hard time earning at school, and he he said, I can't think what he called me. Or where they even name me, he said, "You, you are going to be able to be a good lawyer, but you got to get out of this law school to do it." And he says, "Don't, don't quit trying." And uh, I had watched him, you know, and we we had come conversations different times and stuff and I can remember sometimes almost verbatim what he said and so when I started being financially successful I, I, I think I'm the one that started a fund up there for him I'm not sure but I I know I create I, I made the thing up there and I kept putting giving money every year for a long time Finally, they said that I was a fellow. Well, I guess I gave them $10,000 or so. I think that's what it cost to be a fellow then. A jolly good fellow. <laughs> but I, and Dorothy Salmon, I haven't gotten to Dorothy Salmon, but I see her on here. And she was that librarian, and she she just had a, a way about her of... Uh, being a friendly, helpful person, I don't know, you, you know, you didn't feel any, like there was any meanness in her, or, and she tried to help, and and then I made a B in her class. I'm not going to tell you about these other grades. But <laughs> <laughs> now, did she, I guess she taught research to students? She taught, taught research, and that kind of intrigued me, and I, and and I, I, I can't do this computer research, yeah. but I can beat these people time-wise on finding something almost every time. Except uh, the, the, we got a secretary down there that, that graduated from law school but can't pass the bar. She can't pass that, she passes the bar, but she can't pass that national test. What, is that some? Is that of course I didn't have to take that. Well, they seem to have more, people seem to have more trouble with that than it's anything else. The multiple else. choice questions. Yeah, the multiple. Yeah, multiple the, it's called the multi-state bar examination, the MBE, which is which is. And the, I, I guess is the standards are. I, I guess yes, every, across the country. Every state. I guess every mm -hmm. state uses that now. Pretty much. I mean. Well, people out there in the UK, when they flunk it, is that what's doing it to their most of them? Or? Well, fortunately, we have a very high bar passage rate yeah. at UK. Our, our students are, I think last year was at 93%. So we do, I mean, that's pretty good. I'd say that's really good. U of L was 70% or something at one time. I don't know. I mean, yeah. So you, uh, so you had Dorothy. She taught you, and you studied in the library. Did you Did you ever work in the library at all? With no, her? no. Just studied there with her. Yeah. And she was. Did she have any sort of funny mannerisms or? Well, she was an attractive woman to me, and I don't know if she was dating anybody. I can't remember. She, I know she was single. And I, after I got out of law school, I would see her. I saw her down in the state capitol one time and stopped and talked to her. And she was seemed to be interested in how I was getting along and about my practice and about the family and all that. And, and uh, she was a person of goodwill is what I'd call it. 
and she had an interest in the students, and it never was a time that she, whenever you wanted to stop and ask her about something or try to talk to her, that she wouldn't be available to talk to you. She was a tender side. Some of those people in that law school seemed like that they, they didn't want you to pass. I mean, I'm not. I can't. I can't name a. I can't name a professor that that acted that way. But there was a there was a feeling that some of these guys just didn't want you to pass. Uh, Bill Rivers was that fellow's name that uh, became United States District Attorney. I think he. They, Moreland or somebody had a question on an exam about notice and involving a real estate deal when you rec recorded when you when you file a deed in the courthouse, it doesn't do anything for its validity. <clears throat> but it gives constructive notice to the world about what it says and who's first and all that. And the way he graded that paper, he didn't allow that actual notice would beat the constructive notice. If you could prove somebody knew it, then the fact that the, that the constructive notice is in there, the timing would relate back to the first thing, but you you know you had to prove it. And you know, that, you know, the guy that did that was Red, and he was from London, and he was a firebrand. He, he got in all kinds of fights and stuff all the time. He was that mountaineer guy, and he had that red hair, and I mean, he was nice enough but you get to try to tell him something about the law, and it'd be boom, 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 about two or three passes on these words, and hell, he's ready to fight, and did. And I think he had two or three fights. What was his name? I liked him. He fight law students. Fight anybody. Fight anyone. Yeah. He got, so if he got he got out there jawing, I think, or someplace, he got in a damn fight. So if he got if he didn't like what you had to say in class, he fights you. Well, I don't, I don't think it went that far. But yeah. if you, if you got to debating what was in class, and then it, it just kept going, and you, you smarted off at him, and he thought you was looking down on him. It's just, you know, just he had this personality that he was not going to. He was aggressive, and I don't know exactly how to describe it other than that. But he would fight you, and so when. Moreland, he didn't like Moreland. So when Moreland graded him down on that, he took it up. And and Moreland, they had a, a heated discussion, and then later on, the next day, Moreland came back and said, you're right. Now, you know, I'm talking... I think I've got it right about it. it was a question on this notice. It was the actual constructive. Yeah. Uh -uh. But how in the hell would I remember that, or why would I remember that? Nelson Oberst, but you know he was a, he was a good guy. <clears throat> Scott Reed, Scott Reed, I knew him somehow. Heber, my high school football coach, lived in the basement of that apartment house on the corner of High Street and Rose. Scott Reed and his mother <clears throat> either lived in that apartment building or one right around the corner. And he was county attorney of Fayette County. And somehow their connection through Coach Heber I knew about Scott Reed. He taught me, it says in the summer of 49, part-time summer of 49.
I don't see how he could have taught me, but somehow he taught me, I thought, procedure. But I knew him from before I, before I was in the university some way. He got his LLB in 44 at the University of Kentucky. Well, that's when I graduated from high school. Practiced in Lexington since 44. Well, I don't, somehow I, I thought, he, and he was county attorney, I guess. He, I don't, but he was on the, Court of Appeals when I was in the General Assembly, and he and he and, our, and my past relationship with him was excellent. And you just had to be careful around him. If you said anything about him being short, he'd cut you. He could not take anything about anybody saying he's short. And some people would want to be, would want to do that. I don't know why people do that, but I can assure you it's a mistake to do that, to try to do that with him. So when I worked pretty closely with him in night in. Uh, do you think he ever did cut anybody? Well, not fit, not physically with a knife, but yeah, he'd cut you on something. Okay. He'd, I just was curious. I was like, is that? Is I think he. I think he'd carry. I think he'd, he'd carry, carry a grudge. Yeah. 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 If you. It, but most it would be about if you was demeaning him some. If he thought you were demeaning him some way. He had this complex about his height, and I don't know if it went other ways or not, but if you maybe embarrassed him on an intellectual point or something and made a remark, he'd hold it. But I, I don't know, I can't think of any specific instance where he he decided the case against somebody or something unjustly. Mm. But if, you know, on an outside political thing, you might have trouble yeah. over that. But we worked very closely on this constitutional reform thing. And I tried to get him to wear his robe when the first time that he addressed the General Assembly and presented the judicial budget. Now I don't know how that works. Still, what in the hell is it good does it make if the if the chief justice can present a budget and then can't enforce it? He presents a budget, but apparently they won't. The general assembly won't adopt the budget he presents. And they got people working in the judicial system unmarried mothers on food stamps. The salaries are so low that they are poverty stricken and have to take food or take food stamps. There's something wrong with the system that does that. And of course Scott's long gone. And this Chief Justice we've got now is not very effective in trying to deal with the General Assembly, I think. I don't he can't on his budgets and stuff, and he, but he's up, he's not he won't fight he won't get up there and go toe to toe with them. He's he wants everything to stay peaceful and cover up cover up cover up. We had a dang on circuit clerk down there that was fanny patting up his help and was doing a lot of stuff that was kind of crooked and semi crooked and they catch him and catch him. And they, if they ever did anything to him, it was a private reprimand. But we don't know the Lisa's clerks 
you know, come, they worked for the circuit clerk, her clerks, and those clerks down there were filing complaints against him. One of these girls was a lawyer, and she filed a complaint against him over some sexual advances or something. Never heard anything. Judicial Retirement Removal Commission, it's just, it never, it never did anything. Well, you, um, I have another question just back at the College of Law. Do you remember any students that were women during your time there? Only one. Do you remember, do you remember who she was? Virginia Burbank, I think, was there when I was there. And there was a woman. Uh, she, they, about in my, in my class, there was only one, and she married a guy named Charlie. Something. And they were from Somerset. He was a good lawyer. I'd see them together all the time, at these bar meetings and things. Was she accepted by the other students? More than me. Well, I can't think of any discrimination that might have occurred against her, but I think that it was a whispering thing, you know. It was the guys. These guys had. Some of these guys always had this thing about about women, dumb women, or women that were this or that or the other thing. But I don't I don't think there was. I couldn't see that being put down on her too much. Yeah. But I. What his name was Charlie. I can't think of it. But they were down there in Somerset. He was county attorney down there, I think, at one of the times when I was. What was the, I mean, you kind of mentioned a little bit about grading. Do you think the grading was fair? At UK? Yeah, at the College of Law, yeah. Uh, as far as I know, it was. Hmm. Yeah. I don't, I don't know. Of, uh, there was a guy that was in that class that was a military guy, um, Air Force, and smart. And he ended up not passing the bar. And I, but I, and I thought that was odd. He made real good grades. But that wouldn't be anything the school was doing. What was, I mean, the old building then, it was the Lafferty Hall. Did you all like that school building? I mean, do, is it, did you think it was a nice building to go to school in? Well, I don't know if I thought about it one way or the other. It just was the way it was. It was right there close to that library, and I liked that library, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know. So did you go across the way to the other library, which I get was at that time, was it the King Library? No, it, wasn't, it was named another name. Another name? Before King. So do you, so you didn't, did you study more at the other library or did you study at the law school? I studied more at the law school. At the law school? And at home. Oh. I was in that other library when I was undergraduate hmm. quite a bit. Mm -hmm. So um, did you do, did you uh, have a sort of a trial practice class that you, did you like that or do you remember? Uh, we had a, I've always liked public speaking, and I had a, I had ability, apparently, to, to speak contemporaneously. And I could, I don't know, in high school I had that, and they turned around, they'd, when they had somebody that they want to send somewhere to represent some thing with a kid, well, they they sent me a lot of times mm -hmm. in high school. I went. I, there was a 
the YMCA had a program for young people and they sent the groups of young men to different to conferences on developing personality and morality and stuff and so they had a high wire club I think so we took part in the high Y activities and we had a guy this is a little group of us and there's a guy named Huffman and he wanted to be a high Y uh, had to be a YMCA director in life so when we went to these different conferences they always elected a president or something a chairman or something <clears throat> to run it There's with a by vote well these guys that I was with you know, we, we, we were interested in the politics this vote and stuff was right up our alley all the time so every time we went any place like that hell you know we date these uh, we pick out the ugliest girl there and take them out and try to <laughs> and get them lined up on a boat <laughs> and <laughs> I mean, all kinds of stuff, you know, to to win these damn votes. <clears throat> so we come back, and and the the Lions Club or the Chamber of Commerce would fund these things. So when we came back, well, we had to go down and report on how the, how what we did that justified their money. <clears throat> So we went up there in Wisconsin to some place and, and, and had a, got going and had a hell of a race to get this guy elected. And we lined up all these women. We did everything. And, and, and hell, we brought, brought the home, bacon home again. And he's getting up. He's, we had three or four of these things that we never lost one, really. <clears throat> so they... Mr. Meeks was the director of YMCA, and so he lined up <clears throat> Don Robinson, my good friend, that was that uh, registrar at the College of Pharmacy in Louisville, <clears throat> and later became a law. He had an MS, MA, his master's degree in business, and and his undergraduate from Kentucky, and went to UL Law School. So we were called and went down there and had a, made a speech. Well, I got up first, and so I started telling them how we did this. And oh, they got to laughing. So hell, I got cranked up, and I just so extemporaneous, you know, and hell, I just told it like it was, and they like to die laughing on that. So Robinson gets up to make his speech, and he says, "That's the last damn time I'm going to follow you." <laughs> <laughs> So I'm walking out, mm -hmm. and there's a guy named Adams that was the county judge of Fayette County. Mm -hmm. And when I went out by him, he said, young man, you need to be a lawyer. That's the first time I remember anybody ever saying to me, I ought to be a lawyer. But the, my explanation of that thing in uh, Wisconsin, he thought that, I, my ability to speak apparently was would be a, make me a good lawyer, and I guess it has. Mm -hmm. I don't know that. I know we win a lot more cases than we lose. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that is. Funny. And we, I say it in a proud way. John and I are both have A B A V ratings with Martindale and Hubble, and are the only two. There might be one more lately, but for years we were the only two A-rated lawyers in Bullock County, and that made me proud. Mm -hmm. And when yeah. Lisa, Lisa was, we, there were three of us, and that was maybe the one of the few law firms in Kentucky that I ever remember was rated A. Mm -hmm. So. What is is sort of like putting a sort of capstone on. The, this, 
the idea of being at the College of Law. What did it mean for you to get your, your degree from the University of Kentucky College of Law? Sort of in broad strokes. Well, it, it made my family extremely proud. And so when you do something that you please your whole family, I mean from top to bottom, and I mean it's deep, and that gave me a large measure of satisfaction for them to brag on me. My father said to me after I got out of law school, some problem came up with the, there was, my mother had eight siblings and there was always something coming up in the family. Well, instead of the, one of those eight being the go-to guy, it turns out that the go-to guy is my daddy. So all his married life, all these people with weird family bull, they're coming to him. And he had a wisdom about him about solving those kind of problems and stuff. So something came up, and so he's talking to me, and he's and and he couldn't figure it out. And he said, "Son, you've passed me in this education now so far. I can, I don't know you you're bound to know more about this than I do." And I didn't realize till he died how much I was dependent on him and everybody going there and all at once I'm the go-to guy. And making that step in life, you don't even see it coming. And now everybody's dead almost but me, so I'm not the go-to guy but the family anymore. There's not enough of them around. I don't know what the ones that's cousins that's out scattered around, but uh, they, they, Uncle Billy had had his peculiarities. He and those daggone veterinarians get on an airplane and they'd fly to Cuba for Castro. They'd make all this money on these horses and bam, they're down there in Cuba, wine, women, and song, let the good times roll, <laughs> shooting crap, all that. And when, that wow. when Castro came in there and busted that up, if Uncle Billy could have put a pistol on Castro, he'd have killed him. He, he was really upset by that. He was a cigar-smoking, liquor-drinking, woman-chasing guy and uh, had, a, had, a good, had a good life. And he, But he did a lot of good stuff for people. He was a, he was a people person. So you said that he did the, he was a tax, he was an accountant and he did the taxes for us people. And told you to kind of go to Iowa State. That was that guy. Oh yeah, he didn't. Yeah. He didn't kind of tell me. He told me. Yeah, that's what. That's you what to do. do. And hell, I, I was dumb enough to take his advice. Yes. Yeah. I hadn't gotten to the point then, where I could, I, I could make these decisions. I could analyze something and make good decisions. Yeah. You know, but I always had an interest in agriculture some way. I don't know why, yeah. and in land. I got a sense about land, and and I, I, I think it must be in the genes. Yeah. My father didn't have any interest in it, but my a lot of my people did, yeah. ancestors. Uh, but that UK uh, being having the honor to be from UK and be get have a law degree from UK. A lot of people out in the state think that that's a bigger thing than having one from U of L, and that's pretty nice. Now you get down around Louisville, they don't want to admit it, yeah. but I noticed that, and I, it makes me be proud to be accepted as a lawyer with that addition to your reputation or whatever you want to call it. And then I look back on those professors, like Dr. Murray and Dorothy Salmon and Dean Starr. 
Well, all of them, really. They, they, they did good jobs. Now, Star, you know, Matthews, uh, not Matthews, uh, what's, what's the guy that couldn't speak? He's the most educated guy in here. You, you, Whiteside. 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 How could you not love Whiteside? Yeah. If you if you know anything about people and his wife and his interest and how what he would do and when you talk to him, his body language, he'd get excited about something good. I mean, he he was enthusiastic, you know. And I had I had more personal contact with him after law school than any of these others. I had a guy named Reeves that was a that taught uh, government in undergraduate school, and his his brother was the uh, wrote the revenue code for Guam, and was a tax uh, and 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 was a tax head of the tax thing department in Kentucky. He knew all about that stuff, and he was interested in when he retired from UK. He became a lobbyist for the elderly. This at the time I'm at Frankfurt, and so he's he's down there now. You know, at that time he was down there lobbying the heck out of me for these older people. At and at the time at a time I didn't realize I was getting old. But everything he asked me to do, I jumped on there and tried to do. He was always asking the right thing. He wasn't trying to get something crooked or yeah. or something that wasn't right. Yeah. And uh, so I had a lot of contact with him, and he had an influence on me. Then he had some influence on Elisa. She was going around on these things on the state as a, as a high school stuff, and you get elected president of this or that. And he had a chance to put somebody somewhere. He'd help these. He'd help her. Yeah. And and I appreciated that. I think someone's here. Uh, Hello. Hi, we're, I'm hi. Sorry, no, worry. don't worry. Don't worry at all. It's okay. okay. <laughs> He's right here. Oh, this <laughs> judge this judge Spain yes. by her voice. Hi, I'm Franklin Rengi. We, we uh, so I'm sort of trapped in here, but let me come out and introduce you. It's nice to meet you. Court got done early and Allergies are breaking out like crazy on the courthouse. I just bailed. Yep. You let's know, get out of just, yeah. Just get going. He so. made the mistake of getting in here and couldn't get out, and I've yeah. I've really enjoyed him listening to me. Well, I know you enjoyed him <laughs> listening to you. We've had a great day. We've had a great ever, day. We've been you going. You don't want to ask unless you really want to. Yeah, we've been going since noon, and so we've gone through covered a lot of ground. Gosh, so. I can't. Have I talked to you for three and a half hours? Yes, sir. <laughs> But it's been good. Well, it's exactly good. what the project's about. Is so we've had a really good time. So. Can I get you all anything? No, I think. We, in oh. fact, we were actually just kind of coming to a close. We were just doing our sort of final remarks. So, so you know, I'll, I'll go. Are the I girls, knew I was going to outlast him, Lisa. Yeah. Are the girls on the other side? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Sleeping over yeah, there. they've been sleeping all day. Well, if you've had enough. Well, I have one. I just want to go back to one thing that interested me. You had mentioned that Orlandi, the student with you, was an yeah. Italian who, and you had said that he served in the SS. OSS. The OSS. Oh, I thought that. Okay. The secret. You know, he was a, he was a tough damn soldier. So he was not. The OSS was the on American. the Allied side. Yeah, in, okay. in Italy. I yeah. thought that for a moment that he was. No, no, no. On in the SS as in the German no, sign, no. and I was curious about no. So it's the OSS. So he was an, on the on the American side or the um, Allied side yeah. of doing uh, sort of. I guess at that point that would have been sort of secret service or spy. Yeah, well, it was. Of course, it was. Ar it was in the army, but I think. Or the yeah. old, but the OSS in, in Italy, you yeah. know, they were dropping behind the enemy lines and doing all kinds of stuff. Yeah. But he, he never did. Uh, 
have the attributes of a practicing lawyer. Yeah. And so I don't think he ever did practice yes. law. Hmm. But he he got to be mayor of uh, Jefferson Town, which was pretty good lick. And he said that he was a strong man against bootleggers, is, or no, that was uh, Lafogus, the oh. guy that didn't get in the law school. school. No. Or they kicked him out. I don't know which. Oh yeah, yeah. I can remember him, man. He was he was that wide, just all the way down, <laughs> and he and he wore a trench coat, uh, and that thing was fit him close. But hell, he he he'd go to the ground with these bootleggers out in the woods. Yeah. When he'd go after him, he he brought them back in. And what was his last name again? It was Clefogus. Clefogus. Hmm. Wow. There's a there's a doctor named Clefogus down in Western Kentucky that served in the General Assembly with me. Yeah. And it's part of that family. He's from Lexington. Well, I but it was that association that something happened down there around that Vine Street and politics. Yeah, and so he was. I don't know if he's buying yeah. votes or what he was doing, but Moreland the, didn't want any part of him being in that law school. And that was Clefogus. He did. I can remember they had a face to something. They came together face to face out there, and I could tell more the expression on Moreland's face. I don't know. I might have heard what they said at the time, but I could tell Moreland's animated. All the stuff that Moreland does, he'd be he he had a lot of animation in him, and he was wound up on a boom boom. They were arguing about something, and it was in the law school out there. I think in that old in that lobby where you first come it came in. Is where I can. I haven't thought. I don't know if I'm, you know, you you sparked a memory thing, and I'm. You're not just following uh, through. My with gosh, it. I, how in the, I, but I can't figure out how I could remember something like that. It, brain is a tricky, tricky organ. Yeah. So so it was the last name was Clefogus, and he was the one that Moreland didn't like because of what he was doing down at Vine Street. Well, that's I, now that's. But you think that's that, you're not impression. sure, that's your I'm impression. Not, I'm not, yeah. I just was wanted uh, to make sure was, I understood. But there was, but I know that he didn't like him, and it, and it was, maybe it was a justifiable bias, but he had a bias against him. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, so, but I don't know, yeah. it doesn't make any difference. Yeah. But those, you know, that class... As a whole, I, I'd like to compare it to any class that's ever come out of there. With what they did, mm -hmm. those guys came out of there with that war behind them. Most of them in that class were in service, but not all of them. And they had a mission to get to the life's work. And it was inspired after going through that war. I, and I was a whole lot more serious student after that military experience, even though nobody shot at me. When I came back, I was looking to get a hold of it and get in there and get out. Mm -hmm. So I didn't, you know, I didn't get that BS degree. But in 19, I see in 2010 or nine, Scott Miller, attorney in Louisville, who served on the Board of Trustees of UL by appointment of Louis Nunn, and has been a lawyer in Louisville for years, was a Sigma guy, and we went to undergraduate school at UK, and then I went to law school at UK, and he went to law school at UofL. His dad was, been a, was a judge circuit judge in there and he went back home so he we stayed in contact with each other and he, he says now Tom says they got a thing out based on life experience and says you if you got enough you can get some grade points on life experience and I don't have any pull at U of L, 
but you got this pool at UK. Now go down there at UK and get us lined up on this life experience. And so we're going to get our BS degrees. And I said, uh, he's a Republican, you know, and I'm a Democrat. But we don't let that get in anybody's way. Because we're not very far apart. There's not much difference in a Southern Democrat who's not race and a moderate Republican. They're right close on all stuff. Mm -hmm. But you can't even get to, you can't even talk about that now. There's no, there's no connection with that. So I said, you think I don't I don't have any tall down there? I said, oh, you, oh, you do, you're a big fellow on this and that. And I said, well, hell, Scott, that doesn't amount to anything at all. That's all bullshit. You can't. That doesn't got anything to do with it. Ah, you go down there and do it. I said, all right. So I went down there and tried to find out about it, you know, talking to this one and that one and kind of going around and around and around and around. And I never could get it pinned down. I got the impression they didn't they had it, but they didn't want to turn loose of it. So I said, we're going to have to go down there and find out what's behind this and how you do it. So we went down there, and we decided what we needed to do was get to these secretaries or get to somebody that knew how to do it. Some bitches we were talking to were just leading us from barn to barn, and I don't know why. Some of it, I think, was based on ignorance, and they didn't want to admit that they were uninformed. And I don't, I'm not talking about intelligence now. You yeah. know, when you're ignorant, that means you don't know the facts. To me, don't go to Bullock County and tell a guy doesn't know the facts. He's ignorant, because you'll be looking at the sky right between the eyes <laughs> on the street. <laughs> yeah. You say he's ignorant. Wham! That's it. That's it. <laughs> so we. We do that, and we get down there and make two or three trips over it and get with these secretaries, and and finally we get in there and say, now, you, you're not going to leave this room till you straighten us out. And so they straightened us out, and we went down there, and, and they gave me 11 hours for ROTC credit for my time in the Marine Corps, and they gave him 13 hours for his time in the Navy. And I, for ROTC. So we got awarded our BS degrees and go down there and we lead this procession. There's 4,500 people graduating. And these old farts, they put the two of us at the head of it. And we go down there and it's at that, in Rupp Arena or wherever it was yeah, yeah. And, and have all this award thing made out of it and veterans and you know uh, having our inter in, having our education interrupted and then coming for me interrupted and coming back and and uh, mm -hmm. going through with it and so we got up there two of us on stage by ourselves and uh, got full honors and I got that degree hanging down there now so I'm claiming I got a BS and an LLB which it's probably dead because it's been superseded by a Juris Doctorate, well, yeah. which is a fraud. Actually, they sent me that thing, and then they wanted, if I wanted to get a, they awarded it, but if I wanted a, a diploma, I had to pay $300. I said, hell no, yeah. I'm not doing that. I, I, I either earned it and am entitled to it, or... I, I didn't earn it, and I know I didn't earn it, so it's just a change of something, so hell with that. So this time they gave it, to, they, we got that, and didn't have to pay anything for that, finally. Nice, nice, that's funny. All righty, well, I think I'm I'm ready to kind of close up. I gotta get back you gotta to home go to hell, you're gonna go to bed, he wore it. I gotta get to, yeah. Some bitch wore me out. I gotta get on the road he, he, he wore me clear out. I'm not. If that's, I, but I really, I want to tell you how much I have really enjoyed well, being here. I've really enjoyed this having you here. This is a wonderful, year. wonderful day. If I could do this all day long, I would. I'll tell you that. But let me. Well, it's it. interesting to see kind of. I don't think I'm history exactly, but. Well, you know, I've seen. I, I've lived it through. This depression, and then this war, and then this metamorphosis. The, what, to where we are now and the middle class is being shot. Yeah. It's just being...
when I came down here, there was an old lawyer named T.C. Carroll. And he was a veteran of World War I. And he was supposed to be the best lawyer in Bullock County. He served in the Senate one term, and he was a, kind of a dean. He'd been vice president of the Kentucky Bar Association, and he connected with all these Louisville lawyers socially. His wife was chairman of the Democrat Party, or the woman's thing or something, high-riding people in the state. And he said, Tom, he said, I was born in 1800, 1888 or something. Said, we had railroads, horse, and buggy. Said, I grew, I'm growing up, it's railroad, horse, and buggy. All at once he come out with the automobile. The next thing you know, they got airplanes. And I go to World War I and I see what all's being done with this and that. I don't think he went overseas but he was in World War One. He's on that graduate of the U of K now on that first picture. I don't know if you looked at him after you went to back or not, but I told you two people, T.C. Carroll and Lindsey Thompson. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I, there's not too many people here around that know two people on that first that's, line. Yeah, that's <laughs> they're, first line. They're both gone, of course. But he said, and I've lived through this and gone into air, airplanes and all this, and now a man on the moon. How in the world can you go from a horse and a buggy walking and a train to a man on the moon? Yeah. And he used to be in the courthouse, be looking up deeds, and I'd hear him saying, this world and then the next and then the fireworks. So all at once, I'm 88 years old, and I think I've outlived him. I think he died in his 80s, but I think I've, in that span, mm -hmm. I'm talking to people in Bullock County every day, and they, they don't have any knowledge or information about this sequence here locally. When I came to Bullock County, you had three blacktop roads and 11,000 people. A guy named Jiggs Buckman got elected Attorney General in 1951, went to Frankfurt in 52, and somehow I stumbled into buying a movie down here in Bully County, and, and he heard I was a lawyer, and so he wants somebody to go in his office, and he calls me to see if I want to go. Well, I came down here, I was working at that bank, waiting on the bar exam, mm -hmm. <clears throat> making $300 a month. And I'm looking around and I don't see how I can make $300 a month. He says, you can. He said, look, I do all these income taxes. This was in, in the fall, so this, that was coming up. And says, I, you know, I get $5 sometimes for doing the state and the federal. You know, to get a farm in there, I might get 10. But, you know, get two bucks on doing that estate return. He said, you, you'll you get to do all that. Those people are going to come back here to this office. You're going to have my name on the window. He said, you'll get them. And You know, I do this work for the bank. They pay $7 and a half for you to run a mortgage and draw a note and a deed. And you don't have to go back except to the last exam they had. And they've got mortgages on nearly every farm piece of property in Bullock County, so that's a short thing. So you got that, and you're going to do this and going to do that. You get the collections, and you know, you got these grocery bills. You get this, if you got a $15 grocery bill to collect it, you get a third. You make $5. You're making $300 a month. If you work, you can get do it. Well, I'm sitting there. <laughs> I mean, it's like I'm a man walking the plank. You know, I was married, didn't have any children. I didn't know anybody in Bullock County, but one guy, his name was Simmons, a fraternity brother. All he wanted, and all I heard out of him when I was at UK, he was a Sigma Chi, and I ran a Sigma Chi house, is he wanted to get out of Sheep Town. That's what they call Shepherdsville. His, 
he was an ancestrally pioneer people that come in here and had land grants and he couldn't stand it he wanted to get out so what am I going to do so that's just that luck played into it and and it's just a, it's just a looking back over 88 years and I, you know, it's, I see these roads being built, and he exercised his influence as, as attorney general, in a, with the buck, with the Doc Beecham machine, and Laurie Weather being this Louisville machine, and that that woman in there that, that used to be the head of the Democrat Party in there, and man, they were tough. Used to get an election fooling with them. And so Buckman had all this influence, and he built these roads left and right. Time he got out of office, every state road in Bullock County, but one was blacktopped. And I saw all that, and we didn't. When I came out here, I got to be city attorney in just a few years of Shepherdsville. Well, I got them lined up. To be to get a planning and zoning thing, we had to get in line, and then I got a letter about two years after we lined it up. So we they come in, we have the first planning and zoning, and then along later on, I get to be county attorney with a guy named Ferris, as county judge, and we can't control the blasting rock quarries and all this industrial dumping coming out here, Ford, GE, all these big companies coming out here with this paint and liquids and stuff, highly hazardous, poisonous stuff, and putting it in our ground. So we, we the, the people can't control it. We can't control it as government. So Ferris is able to sell a place that you couldn't ever sell zoning to if it wasn't something horrifying coming down. And that's how we got it. And here I am sitting in on it. Mm -hmm. Now I'm walking down the street and a woman comes up and says, Tom, Mr. Magruder, who owns a telephone company, wants to talk to you. Do you, would you come over and talk to him? I said, yeah. I go over there. He says, the Chamber of Commerce and the Farm Bureau want to take my telephone company away from me and I want to keep it. Can you represent me? I said, well, yeah. I had had a course in administrative law with a guy named Marks in my class. He's a top student. He's up there at Lexington. So instead of going and getting a lawyer that really knew something, I go get Marks, and we file these petitions down at the Public Service Commission. He's smart, and he, and he gets stuff lined up pretty good. His mother married Dr. Webb at the, you know, do you ever know Dr. Webb? I heard hear of him. He taught physics out there with in Funkhauser's era. Mm -hmm. They were grave robbers together on all the digging up Indians, bones and stuff. You know, they didn't have any controls over that. And every summer, Funkhauser and Webb went out with a bunch of students. They were ravishing Indian mounds. They dug all, there's a, you didn't know that? Well, that building up there that used to be a museum between the student union and the law school where that guy's, is there a square brick building in there? Can you, do you remember? There, well, between the student union and the law building, they was doing there a lot of construction. I mean, there's the big Patterson Tower, the big skyscraper. Well, they might have torn that building down, yeah. but it, it was a sm nice, small, relatively small brick building. It was a museum of some kind, and they'd, uh, they'd store all these bones in it. Mm. And I used to go up there as a kid and look at them. But when I, Funkhauser taught me zoology when I was going up there. When you were at school at UK. Yeah. And he'd talk a little bit about some of that. And, I, and Webb taught me physics. And he would talk about, Webb was a lawyer, mm -hmm. but he couldn't stand any D 
deviation. He wanted to be in a world where two plus two was always four. Yeah. And when you get in this law thing, when it's never the same. I mean, these damn thing blurs and the, the line changes and circumstance and fact. I mean, he he just didn't like it. Yeah. And. Uh, That's so physics would have been right for him. Yeah, but you know, when you're going through all this, and now then. Mm -hmm. I, I just have a lot of this stuff that I can remember, and I'm able to shoot these guys down. They come up with the stuff, and I know better just from memory of what it really is, and I have a big advantage on that, but it's a disadvantage to be getting old and people thinking you're in the way. And I just tell them, be careful with an old fart because he might know something you need to know. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> or you use it against you or something. <laughs> yeah, that is true. That is so true. right now we got a lot of trouble here in the government. Uh, are you interested in government? Is that no? Yeah, absolutely. Well, we, yeah, you know, I've been county attorney five. Well, you don't know, but I've been elected county attorney five times. Yeah. Not in a row. I never had a public office. I made a living out of. Mm -hmm. I always kept my law practice a separate building. Yeah. I was elected state representative twice. Yeah. And I was chairman of the Democrat Party once. And I lost a lot of elections. Yeah. <laughs> and my daughter lost elections, but she's won two now, the two that count. Mm -hmm. She's one of them. So we got a, a political thing, historical thing about that. And the fiscal court of the county judge has got a system going where they had, the last three years, they have had approximately 500 line transfers in the budget. Mm -hmm. That's 10 a week. You're not supposed under law to have a line transfer except if you get income unanticipated and you and you blend that into your budget and change what to put the money where you want to spend it or if there is an emergency well hell bully county's having 10 emergencies a week and it's a gra it's not a budget or not a thing that stops you from spending. They just been reaching in there and changing yeah. whenever they want to do it. They they're doing it, and now this new fiscal courts come in, and I'm trying to stay out of it so that I don't hurt Lisa. But some of these people I'm whispering counsel to are fed up with this business, and they they she's not letting anybody talk during a any meeting at the, of the fiscal court except at the end after they already voted on everything when they're voting on it they won't let you talk of course the, 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 the solution for that partially is to file a declaration of rights and have it declared by a court whether or not she as county judge presiding in a meeting can refuse to permit a citizen to stand up and object Prior to. or ask the question about why are you doing that? Mm -hmm. And so but that's kind of getting ready to happen. And I've got all this history in my head. This woman's been in there now for, this is her third term, and she's always blamed it on the fiscal court. Well, the first time there was Democrats in there. The second time there was all Republicans. And this third time, they're all kind of hardened, case-hardened Republicans. But they don't like it when the county is not operating under that budget. You know, they, they don't want to tax anybody, so they don't want to spend any money. And But trying to bring these department heads under heel... Well, I'm boring you. I don't yeah, know. No, no. I just was... I, I actually... I need to use the bathroom. Well, let me run to the bathroom. You stay right no, here. No, no. You've infected me. I've got the same disease you've got. All right. Well, let's see if you can slip right through. Yeah, there. I can get through there. Uh, 
You go that way and I'll go this way. All right. I'll be back. You know what that you know what that first one is. Yeah, I'll be right back. All right. Ha! <laughs> <laughs> there, baby, what did you think? I was oh. shifting around in my seat there. Oh.